Hi, and welcome to Minutes with Mikhail. Today, I am ecstatic to have Zach Goins, the Associate AD for Development at the University of Illinois, join the show. Zach, how are you doing today? I'm great, Dan, and it's great to see you again. I know it's uh, it's been a while since I, I think I probably saw you last, uh, but I'm looking forward to this. This is exciting. Good. Yeah, me too. Well, let's uh, let's get started. You know, but this show is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to have on some great guests, and you being our first one is tremendous. Uh, we want to educate our, our audience and and learn from uh, someone who's had a very successful career in athletics uh, and, and how they got started. So, you know, first, just talk to me about your current role in Illinois and what you're responsible for. Yeah, no, Dan, I appreciate that. Uh, my role right now, I'm the Associate Athletic Director, as you mentioned, for development. Uh, my role's changed a little bit. I've been here 10 years at U of I. Uh, my first job uh, with Illinois Athletics was overseeing our Chicago fundraising office. We have a satellite office. Not every school has something like that, whether it's um, a small school or a big school. If you're near a large metro market, it tends to work if you've got a group of dedicated fundraisers or a small team so you can utilize the uh, the number of alums that we have in the market here. So I've been in, in I was in started in Chicago in 2012 and was here from 2012 to 2016. And then when we finished, um, when I finished the, uh, the stint, first stint here in Chicago, I was uh, asked to come to campus down in Champaign because we were beginning our uh, $300 million with Illinois uh, fundraising campaign. Wow. So part of my role was to oversee that fundraising campaign from the athletic side, um, combination of uh, doing major gift fundraising in addition to just kind of managing the day-to-day -day and the strategy behind that campaign. So I spent um, really, I'm still down there. I'm still in Champaign and will continue to live in Champaign. But uh, but my role now uh, is a little different in that I still have the major gift fundraising responsibilities. I still have some of the uh, annual planning and, and strategy uh, responsibilities, but I'm also now overseeing I'm back kind of back where I started. I'm overseeing the uh, Chicago fundraising office wow. here in Chicago. So I'm actually in my office in Chicago right now. Um, and I'm, I'm going to spend some time, you know, strategically when I come up here and I, it won't be every day, obviously, but uh, probably two to three times a month at least. Great. Uh, depending upon what's happening. We've got the Big Ten tournament coming up. Uh, here in March. So I'll certainly be up here uh, for a good chunk of the beginning of March as well. So, but I love it. I love Chicago and, um, but I, I will continue to live in Champaign. There's no question about gotcha. that. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, it's exciting. Well, good. Well, no, like I know you're a University of Kentucky graduate. Uh, just tell me about your journey though. How, how did you get your start, your foot in the door? Um, was there a, a particular person or a mentor? Uh, tell me about your journey. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the mentorship thing is really fascinating to me because I'm I am fascinated personally and professionally about how mentors uh, can help people professionally grow and frankly personally grow. And I've never been one that sticks with like here's my mentor. That's the one individual that's going to help me. I have mentors from every stop that I've been at. I've been at five institutions professionally. And for but for me, it even goes all the way back to when I where I grew up in Dayton, outside of Dayton, Ohio. I went to a Kettering Alter High School and, you know, was a, a very bad freshman basketball player and but had the opportunity to come to UK for college. Uh, and when I came to Kentucky, uh, I'd be lying if I, I didn't tell you that a large part of that was because of basketball. So right. my high school basketball coach. I was closely connected with Coach Patino, who everybody knows, uh, through Five Star Camps, which you're very familiar with. Right, right. And uh, I had the opportunity to go to UK and meet uh, the legendary Bill Kitely, the equipment manager at UK for 40 plus years. And when I went to Kentucky, I knew I wanted to stick around basketball. So the long story uh, short on that is I went to Kentucky for basketball as much as anything else, Great. knowing that I would have the opportunity to be a student manager, be around the program on an everyday basis, be around the athletic department on an everyday basis, uh, learn from what for me in my four years turned out to be two very different but incredibly successful head coaches with Rick Pitino for two years and then Tubby Smith for two years. Uh, but that's how I got to UK. And, you know, growing up in Dayton and being around, I grew up around the University of Dayton athletic department. 
uh, from about third and fourth grade, I would work summers. I'd be at the football camps. I would assist uh, Tony Caruso, who was their equipment manager for, he's like their version of Bill Kitely at Dayton. Um, so I knew I wanted to stick around sports, be around sports. And when I got to UK, I realized I wanted to stay in college athletics as a career. And that's a little bit kind of how it got started. It went from, you know, being around athletics and sports on a, on a regular basis at the University of Dayton to coming to Kentucky. And it really just continued to grow from there. So that's tremendous. I mean, yeah. heck of a story. And to be where you are right now, um, it's just a testament of how hard you've worked along the way. So that kind of brings me to my next question. You know, there are a lot of young kids that want to get into athletics. They see it on TV and they, they don't know if they want to coach or be an administrator. Um, you're 21, 22 year old college grad that's looking to break into college athletics. What advice would you give to them? That's it's a, another good question. The, the thing that, that I always tell, uh, whether they're aspiring, you know, administrators, it could be any area, it could be fundraising, could be marketing, could be, you know, any of the, the growth areas that we have is what start, try to think about 10 to 15 years ahead, rather than just thinking about what's coming up the next day. Gotcha. And the reason I say that is if, if you realize and can learn at the uh, sophomore, junior year of, of college, what it is you want to do, then you can begin to start to plot out or plan your career path. And if you definitely learn and get exposed to like I, I was a graduate assistant um, in the ticket office at Indiana University where I got my master's degree. And I learned that I don't want to ever work in ticketing full time. <laughs> yeah. And so you 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 can kind of in compliance. I, I originally thought I wanted to work in compliance, more the internal side of the business, and that just wasn't for me either. I wanted to be around people. I wanted to find an opportunity for growth. So at being an athletic director it was always kind of at the the top for me. The, it was kind of the pinnacle of where I wanted to wind up. Right. So I kind of built from there, and that's how I got exposed to. Uh, an internship when I graduated from IU, I went and worked for the National Association of College Directors of Athletics, NACTA, which is our professional organization across all of college athletics. Right. And from there, I learned a lot more about development, fundraising, revenue generation. And to be honest with you, especially if you look at our industry now, that is the backbone of what we do. And you have to be able to generate revenue, raise money in order to provide the opportunities for the student athletes uh, at the level, at the elite level that you want to. So that's a big part of it. So I made a decision to, to go into development and I've been in development, fundraising, advancement. It's, it's got a number of different terms yeah. for it, but uh, for over 20 years now at uh, wow. five that's different that's institutions. So, yeah. Oh, uh, that leads me to my next question. That's great. You know, ever changing world of college athletics, college athletics, doesn't look the same that it did a year ago or frankly 10 years ago um what do you think the biggest challenges that student athletes and administrators are facing in this day and age 2023 yeah so it's so funny the the issue that we there are many more there are many issues i think and and there's no question that the the COVID period disrupted an awful lot of what we had some major projects that we had to shelf when we went through the COVID. Uh, when COVID first came into our lives and, and really started to impact daily life, uh, not just, you know, what we do in our business, but um, what we had to, to really take a look at is all of, in our athletic director, who's, I, I think the best athletic director in the country, Josh Whitman, really has a degree of foresight and is a forward thinker and very proactive and you know, he made a good point when we were talking with a group of donors at the very onset of COVID when we shut down and we had to cancel the Big Ten tournament and the NCAA tournament and everything else, um, that the day and age that we're in right now in college athletics, so to hopefully answer, answer some of your question here, is all of the different things that we're seeing happen, uh, and that, that goes all the way through with the transfer portal, uh, name, image, and likeness, which I think we'll talk a bit about, Right. Uh, the change uh, that's coming with the college football playoff. Uh, There's so many different f items that are, are hitting college athletics. Uh, now it's all happened within a year, 18 months. Those are major, even one of those major issues in one in a year would be kind of a, a game changer for the business. Right. Absolutely. But we had four or five hit I know. in, you know, 18 months. 
So I think balancing that out and, and trying to figure out what the best path forward is and, and prioritizing taking care of, honestly, the most important thing that, that we found, one of the most important things that we found is we have to make sure that we're taking care of our student athletes from a mental health standpoint, because when all those changes hit and they hit at the same time, that's devastating for 40 year old administrators, 50 year old right, administrators, right. but it's incredibly <laughs> devastating for an 18 to 23 year old student athlete who's still trying to find their way in the world. Um, so all those things that hit, uh, balancing those out has been tough, but we're still in a good position, I think, moving forward where we're at. There's a, a lot of faith in college athletics. There's, there's a lot of value in college athletics and what it does. Um, it, so I think the biggest thing for us is just making sure that we take each of those major items that we're trying to address and we prioritize those appropriately to provide the best possible experience for the student athlete. And we're still focused on success. We're still focused on doing things at a, at a high elite level, but we also want to make sure that at the core of it all is that experience for the, the young man or young woman. That's and what, what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. But you talked about NIL. Let, let, let's, let's yeah. talk about that for a few minutes before, before we wrap up. Sure. Uh, it's ever changing. It's, 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 it's not going away. Um, how do you guys handle it at Illinois and, and what's your basic thoughts on, on, on it going forward? So, you know, my personal opinion on it is in, in that, that interviews with my, professional opinion, frankly, is I think it's a law, it's going to be a long term value add yep. uh, for everything we do. And the reason is, this is the first time that you and I went to school with and are friends with several people that had NBA careers. And, but when they were in college, the opportunity wasn't there, and they could have capitalized on their right. main image and likeness to, to, you know, reap some some pretty good rewards in terms of whether it's financial or, you know, opportunity or access. I think our student athletes now have that ability. Right. I think that's a positive thing. It's just a matter of how each, uh, frankly, each state handles it. Uh, NCAA has finally put in some guidelines, uh, which clarifies a little bit the process in which we as fundraisers especially can take or can't take uh, to help generate some of the revenue or get investment in NIL for our student athletes. But I think I think NIL overall is a is going to be uh, value add for everybody that's involved. It's just a matter of still. It's like anything new. You you got to learn how to put it into uh, process and how you how you make yeah. it work. So do you guys have multiple collectives or or just one? How's that work? We we have we have two. Uh, one that's 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 opening up now that will have a much larger rollout for a new NIL collective that we're starting here at Illinois. Um, called the Icon Collective. And then we also have the Alina Guardians, which were the, the original. Uh, and that, I would view it this way. The Alina Guardians are a bit more like an annual fund. So okay. you, you want to give $50 a month or you want to do gifts of $100 a year, $1,000 a year. And I mean, all of that's incredibly important. And right. that money can be can be utilized. And what we do is put, put it into play from a community relations or a community uh, investment um, platform. So Boys and Girls Club, YMCA. So the student athletes don't have to go into a, necessarily a car dealership and, you know, hawk, hawk the wares of the dealership. They yep, can yep. go and do work at the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA or at, you name your, your charitable organization. Our student athletes can do that. So the Illini Guardians have done that a little bit on the, uh, from a, a lower dollar level, right? So you can invest it in whatever you think works for you. And then the Icon Collective will be a little bit larger, and that will be uh, larger investments, and those investments will be uh, similarly tied to community uh, opportunities for the student athletes to go and uh, render their service in order to to receive the uh, the payment that they would get for yeah. doing that work. Right. So we have two collectives. NIL, I think, for us is is now just a, a process of interweaving that i've got some meetings coming up today and, and all day friday uh that we're going with our president and ceo of our new collective to talk about both nil and uh and, and our traditional fundraising uh, models and vehicles to right. help illinois athletics so we're constantly talking about both and we're trying to figure out how we put the potential donor investor in the best position position to make an impact and help make an impact that they feel good about so uh, to be honest with you, Dan, here's the bottom line is that 
you know, I've been doing this over 20 years. This is the biggest change for me mm -hmm. uh, being, you know, a little bit older in the business uh, it, we're, because we're just so used to doing things the same way. Right, right. right. You can come up with creative ways to do it or you can be a little bit more innovative. And that's what we're trying to do. And I think have done. We've been very proactive at Illinois on the NIL space. Um, it's just a matter of education and getting all of our alums and uh, current or potential donors and current and potential investors in NIL to understand the value that this is going to provide. Yeah, that makes sense. It really and does. Big part of it is, is frankly, because you can't use NIL and we don't use NIL as a, um, you know, kind of a, a carrot to dangle because you can't connect it at all with recruiting and we don't. Right. right. But you definitely can use it for retention. So if you have a site and that that ties in with the transfer portal. So if you have a student athlete that's a freshman or a sophomore that's had a great year, name the sport, doesn't matter. Um, we want to make sure that they feel valued and have that opportunity to uh, receive some kind of, uh, you know, monetary benefit for being at Illinois. Yeah, through the Illinois well deserved process. Correct. So we want yeah. we don't want them to jump into the portal and leave. Listen, as so. a former coach, I mean, the, the worst thing you have is a kid walk into your office that you know you've got a great relationship with, but yeah. he sees the greener pastures are somewhere else. And um, right. I think the retention piece is huge. Yeah. So. so we're spending a lot of time on that. That's good. Um, yeah. Good. Well, this was fun, Zach. I really appreciate you coming yeah, on the show. And uh, I know – Illinois athletic winter sports are, are, are heading in the right direction down the stretch and fun times ahead. Big 10 tournament, like you talked about, I was able to coach in that many times and yeah, uh, right. there, yeah. there's nothing better. Um, yeah. So this was great, man. I can't wait to catch up with you some more at the final four. And uh, I really appreciate you being on. Sounds good, Dan. I appreciate it very much. Looking forward to seeing the, the growth of, of not just this platform, but everything else you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate that, Zach. A lot of fun. Okay. Well, this was great, guys. Dan McHale had Zach Goins on the show. Uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.